Welcome to Sailing in the Mediterranean and Beyond podcast. I'm your host. My name is Franz. Well, this is going to be one of those episodes that I'm actually turning into a YouTube video because I'm going to be talking about an image that I took last summer, which was about, uh, which which was a, which was an image of my anchor and the bow of my boat, and I've talked about this in past episodes on my double anchoring technique, but I took this photograph specifically so I could talk about it uh, on a podcast and in a video, so. If you want to watch the video, it's going to be a little more descriptive than the podcast. But also on the website, medsailor.com, I'm going to be having the image in the post so you can take a look at it there. Before we get on to this episode, however, let me thank my sponsor, Sailrite. This show is sponsored in part by Sailrite. Since 1969, Sailrite has been equipping self-sufficient sailors with tools, supplies, and knowledge they need to sew for their boats. This second-generation family business is also the maker of the Sailrite UltraFeed sewing machine. The UltraFeed is a portable, heavy-duty sewing machine that was designed to handle all your maritime sewing projects from sails to covers. At Sailrite, you'll find everything you need to take on your next do-it-yourself project, including fabric, tools, hardware, and even hundreds of free how-to video tutorials. Start your next project at Sailrite.com. That's S-A-I-L-R-I-T-E dot com. Well, before we get into the body of the podcast, I want to thank Jonathan, or John, Johan, Johan, is it Johan or Johan, anyway, Johan Sande for the pledge of $1 as a Patreon. Thank you so much, John, or Johan. I think it's actually Johan. I really appreciate it when listeners choose to support the podcast either by buying my products or by making a pledge in Patreon. So thank you very much. And the Patreon site is located at the website. I think it's Patreon backslash MedSailor if you are looking to become a sponsor or Patreon of the podcast. If you have any thoughts, suggestions, drop me a note, franz1 at medsailor.com. And we did get a note from a listener, Todd. Alex Todd has written me a couple times before, but he wrote me back this week and he said, Hi, Franz, and Happy New Year. I appreciate your calls for suggested experts on cruising with pets on your podcast. I wish I could suggest some potential interview candidates, but I don't. I was listening to one of your episodes recently, the one where you talked about a new Patreon, Kevin Yeager. He had asked you for some tips on how to select a good charter company for new bear boaters. What jumped to mind for me was attending boat shows. There are always plenty of charter companies at the exhibit hall for Kevin to talk to and get information from. Even better, I attended the Annapolis Sailboat Show last October. And they had all the charter companies grouped together in an area called Vacation Basin. It was a great opportunity to see not only what companies and boats were available, but just the sheer variety of locations. Kevin wrote to you about wanting to start with places that didn't have too much culture shock for him and his family. Vacation Basin would have given him plenty of options. I also like that the charter companies themselves seem to work together to guide customers toward the best fit for their needs. I sat through a presentation on cruising the Croatian coast, sponsored by three to four different companies. One was geared toward families, one was towards bareback charters, one with crude charters, etc. True, they could have all been owned by the same parent company, but they did address the different needs of each audience. On a different note, another podcast I listened to had an episode you might be interested in, Boat Radio has a variety of different shows about different topics, and one of them is Sundowners, which discusses how to make drinks based upon a given theme. In October, they did one on drinks made with ouzo. (laughs) I've tried several of their recipes alone. Sadly, ouzo is a tough sell to friends who aren't in a Greek frame of mind, 
And they're quite good. They may come in handy next summer. The link below the, is the episode which first aired on October 26. And uh, if you're looking at the at the at the website, I'll put a link to this at the website. And if you're watching the video on YouTube, you can see it right there. Anyway, thanks, Alex. Really appreciate it, Alex. And uh, Kevin, there's some thoughts for you. I think that's about as good as I could think of. Uh, as a suggestion for finding a good charter company. All right. So I actually thought about doing this episode quite a while ago, but I didn't really have the proper image to, to go through it. So what I've got on the screen in front of me right now, and as if you're listening to this as a podcast, I'm going to try to describe it as well as I can. I'm looking at the bow of my boat. I'm probably about four feet from the very uh, end of my, uh, my hull. And, of course, beyond that, I have a bowsprit that extends beyond that. And you'll notice I've got a new staysail uh, roller furling, which was put on this year. It's just right there. And, and when they were putting on the staysail, I had to warn them not to put it where they normally put the staysail drum, which would have been right down on the fitting. I told them they had to put a, a a distance, a, a, a length there so that I could get my anchor up around the drum of the staysail. And they didn't have any suggestions, but fortunately for me, I had an extra turnbuckle down in my locker that I brought up, and, uh, and you can see that that's the turnbuckle we have there connecting to the staysail roller furling drum. So that's, that's new on my boat. And I'm going to just start from the bow of the boat going on back. A few years ago, I had to replace my bowsprit. One of the main reasons I had to replace my bowsprit is you see how my bow rollers or, or my uh, anchor rollers attached to the bowsprit. Before, I had a solid, uh, well, a solid rod that went from one roller on one side to the other roller on the other side, as well as other all thread that went to hold on the, the bow rollers. There's a bow roller on the right side and a spare bow roller on the left side. Now those bow rollers, I actually made a pattern and cast those myself. So that's one of my custom fittings on my boat. And you, as you can see, it's green, so that's made out of bronze, and it's very strong. Well, when I had to replace my, my bow sprit, I decided I did not want to have to replace it again in my lifetime, so I eliminated all through... Uh, all, any hole that went all the way from one side of the bowsprit to the other side of the bowsprit, I eliminated entirely. So you will see there's two stainless steel bands uh, that are attached to the bowsprit that hold the, the rollers below the actual uh, bottom part of the bowsprit. So the roller, the solid all thread, well, I guess it's not all thread. The, the shaft that holds the rollers on goes from one side all the way through to the other side. It's one solid shaft. Uh, I think it's three-quarter inch stainless steel threaded on both sides. But it is actually below the bowsprit, so it's not going through the bowsprit any longer. And then those two stainless steel bands that go around that um, are, are also holding the the bow rollers below the bowsprit, so I don't have the problem of dry rot or rot getting into the bowsprit in the future. In addition, you see there's a little um, cable, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, bale that goes across from the, the top, so that would keep the chain from jumping out of the rollers. In the past, I had a piece of all thread that went through there, but the end of the anchor would catch on to that when I would bring up the anchor and so you can see I've made plenty of room for the anchor to pull up and get through the end of my uh, or get around the bow roller when it's being pulled up now I have no problems at all pulling up or dropping down the anchor but here's what I really wanted to talk about you'll see on my anchor and you can see it's a 35 pound CQR anchor of course you can't see that but I'm telling you what it is it's a 35 pound CQR anchor and you'll see that I have a yellow polypropylene rope where I've, uh, well, I put an eye splice in it and then turned it in on itself, and it's attached to a shackle 
that is the lifting shackle on the uh, on the CQR anchor. Now, almost all anchors have something like this on them. I I know I've seen them on Bruce anchors uh, where you can actually attach a line to it. Uh, but what I don't see is people that have this polypropylene rope on it. And the reason I have this on here is because with the polypropylene, and I specifically chose polypropylene is because it floats, and I specifically chose yellow because when I'm swimming around, it's easy to spot. That's about mm, probably about 10 feet of polypropylene line I've got on that. And I like to go down and look at my anchor after I set my anchor when I come into an anchorage. So what this does is, if, as you get closer and closer to the bottom of the, uh, the, the seabed, it becomes murkier and murkier. And sometimes it's really hard to find your anchor. Even if you're following the chain out from the boat, it disappears into this murky mist. And you really, it's really sometimes really hard to, to spot your anchor. Well, with that polypropylene rope, or line, I guess there's no rope on a boat, I'm not, and I'm not sure what that would actually be called. But anyway, that polypropylene line, I've got it so it will float up above the seafloor. So I'll be swimming along looking for my anchor, and I'll spot this polypropylene line just floating there, just right above my anchor, and then I can go down and, and pick it up. Now, I have anchored in uh, 10 feet of water in the past, and my... Uh, the depth of my my keel is about five feet, so I've had only five feet underneath my keel in the past, and that polypropylene line will sometimes actually float on the top of the water. And in that case, I sometimes will go out and attach a, um, uh, a marker of some sort, either a fender or something like that, so people can see it, because I worry about somebody f driving over the top of it and getting it tangled in the propeller. So if it's actually that close to the top, I will want to mark it so people don't drive over the top of it. But most of the time, I'm in around 20 to 30 feet of water, and I don't have that problem. Let's zoom in on this. Yeah, here, are the, here are the uh, the bands that I'm talking about that that hold the uh, the bow rollers, and you can see these the the, sh the shaft for the rollers goes from one side to the other side, and uh, Everything is below the actual bowsprit. And here's the polypropylene line. And, uh, and on the other end of the line, I've got another uh, eye splice uh, spliced into the end of the line. And the reason I have that eye splice there uh, was demonstrated last summer. So last summer, I was sailing, well, we sailed actually from Bodrum to Kosh, and we worked our way up. And, of course, this was my original plan, this green line on, on Google Earth. Uh, but what we did is we went from um, uh, Lipsis, we spent a night up in Faruni, and then we went over and I actually changed crews over here on Samos. And so we went into this harbor uh, in Campos, or, well, I guess it's called Campos, but anyway, in, in Maratha Combo. And we came in here, and we actually tied up uh, on this southwest key, and we dropped our anchor way out past the center towards the other key, the the, the middle key, and backed into the to the to the concrete key. And uh, <laughs> that wind, the wind that night, the wind came up very very strong from the uh, from the north northwest or from our bow and was pushing us back onto it and so we I actually ended up uh, starting the engine and motoring against the uh, against the key away from the key to keep my stern from banging the key I was afraid it was dark and I was afraid of tightening up my bow line any tighter because I've seen it happen where people start tightening on their bow line and tightening on their bow line and pretty soon they've dragged their anchor all the way onto the boat and it was dark and dreary and windy and I didn't want that to happen so that night I ended up uh, staying in the cockpit and just uh, idling the engine to keep the boat away from the key. Well the next morning the wind died down to, to nothing actually it was about four in the morning the wind died down to nothing I was able to 
get down below and go back to sleep. And uh, I went into Pythagoria and exchanged crews. We rented a car and drove into Pythagoria and changed crews. And we came back, and we were going to leave. Well, as we dropped our stern lines and pulled the bow line in, the anchor rode in, we got out here in the middle, and we could not pull the anchor up. We could not pull the anchor up. It was lodged on something. It was obviously caught on something. Uh, my friend Michael Allgood volunteered to put on a mask and snorkel and jump overboard. He was, I think he was a lifeguard, just like I was in his earlier life. Jump overboard and go take a look at it and pull it. So when he did that, I released the stress on the anchor line, and he went down there and said, I was grabbed really tough on something. He said he's going to try to pull the anchor out, and he couldn't. He tried three or four times, and he couldn't. I said, okay, just just one more thing. Before you do that, I gave him um, a long line, one of my long mooring lines, and I gave him the end of it. I said, go past this end through through my polypropylene line, pass it through there and bring it back up to me. And he did. And then I cleaned it off one side and then just used it like a double, uh, double Beckett pulley system to, uh, to pull hard on the anchor. And guess what? It freed up my anchor. So I, that was my intention of always having it there. That was the first time in all the 20 years I've been sailing that I've actually needed to use it for its intended pers- uh, purpose. Uh, but it worked like a charm. And so if you don't have something like this set up on your boat, let me make a suggestion that you do. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is my double anchor technique. And I've described this in the past, and I've uh, written an article or two about it. And again, I don't take credit for this. I copied this from somebody else. But this is how I have set up my uh, double anchor technique. You see, I've got this... um, uh, I guess it's just Dacron. It's just a Dacron braided line here that I've got a bull end tied around here that goes on a shackle that slides back and forth uh, on the um, on this end on this little rod that separates the two flukes of the CQR anchor. It just goes back and forth. So I've t- I've got this Dacron line braided Dacron line tied onto it, and again, it's about mm, probably about 15 feet long. And I've just got it running around here, and when it's not in use, normally when I just have my anchor up, I will just have it wrapped around my bits here. These are my bits. It'll just be wrapped around there like the polypropylene line will when I'm just sailing, going from port to port. But in this situation, I had actually set up my double anchor technique for some reason. I don't remember if I actually used it that night or or what the reason was, or maybe I brought it up in the morning and I took this picture. But uh, but over here, I've got a little fluke. What is it? It's a FX-11, so I'm not sure if that means it's 11 pounds or whatever, but it's a Fortress FX-11 Fortress anchor. And uh, I've got a shackle in that, and I've got... Um, I, I, I normally don't have this tied to this anchor, but when I decide I want to go ahead and deploy my double anchor technique, I will just take this braided line tie a bull on into the shackle, and I'll also put an overhand knot just for safety uh, at the end of it. And then when I'm dropping anchor, I will go up to the bow and slowly lower this over. It'll, the uh, CQR ankle will be in its uh, rollers just like this, or it might just be hanging down a little farther. I'll lower the fortress anchor down and then slowly lower the the, the anchor chain, the anchor road uh so that the fortress anchor hits the bottom of the seabed first and the wind starts blowing us downwind and I will then gradually lower my anchor until the CQR is now behind the fortress anchor and then let out my scope accordingly and then give it a good tug to make sure everything's set well. And uh, that's my double anchor technique. Maybe a picture's worth a thousand words, and I thought I would uh, put this together for you. That's going to be the end of this podcast. If you have any thoughts, suggestions, comments, drop me a note, franz1 at medsailor.com. If you'd like to be a supporter of the podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon at patreon.com backslash medsailor. Until the next episode, thank you for listening.
life is short. In the end, all that really matters is the memories you make. So make a few. Go sailing. <laughs>